I've been asked by ACSM to introduce Lyle McKaylee, who is the AOSSM exchange lecturer. I had the privilege of um, doing a fellowship with him 30 years ago, and I remember dropping slides and copying slides, so we've come a long way in the last 30 years. I also had the uh, privilege of introducing him as the Sutton lecturer three years ago, uh, just after the Boston uh, Marathon bombing. So from the Boston Ballet to the Boston Marathon, he is Dr. Boston Strong. Uh, his lecture today on ACL injuries in young athletes, current concepts, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention, and it's been interesting, the mentors that I have are more into prevention these days. I don't think we'll put ourselves out of business as orthopedic surgeons, but prevention is key, I think. So a lot of those, these, you guys in the room have been influenced by Dr. McKaylee, so I thought I would spell out his name and what he means to me. M, mentor. I, icon. C, champion. H, hero. E, energy, everlasting, the energizer bunny, as Ruth Sol Solomon can attest to. L, leader. Uh, I, individual. And the Lyle is loving, yes, laughing, even if he doesn't show it. And AOSSM, always over-serving, simply McKaylee. I would like to introduce Dr. Lyle McKaylee. Thanks, Mary Lloyd. We're going to talk about the ACL issues in the, the child athletes, the little ones. And I think that's a, it's a very interesting story. There's a lot of interest, obviously, in ACLs now and in and, and very recent years, prevention. And we now have a prevention center out in Waltham, we're trying to prevent ACL injuries. And um, yet I think that it's an it's a interesting scenario. Uh, as a reviewer for the American Journal of Sports Medicine, we get, we get warnings when, you, when you're reviewing an ACL paper now, because there's apparently thousands of them now submitted to, the, uh, to that journal. It's got to be really, really special to, to advance on to the editorial scenario. But the ACL story is an interesting one historically. I, I have a historic perspective, having been around for a while. Uh, Dan O'Donohue uh, was a, a team doctor out at uh, Oklahoma. He went to Harvard Medical School, and he talked about the unholy triad of a medial meniscus, MCL, and an ACL in the, in the impact sports, football. He was a football guy. Um, the Turok textbook of 1959, that was the Bible of orthopedics at that time, 1959, often does not require repair. That's the ACL. You know, it happens sometimes, but forget about it. Just go in and do a total meniscectomy of the medial meniscus. So everything will be okay. Uh, Jack Houston was one to popularize the idea that a certain number of the mechanisms were actually non-contact cutting injuries. And we now know, of course, that in the majority of the kids coming through our clinics, um, two Mondays ago I did five ACLs, and uh, four of the five were in girls, and every one of them was a cutting injury, uh, not, a, not an impact hitting type injury. Uh, John Fagan, and we'll talk more about this in some detail, uh, published an interesting article suggesting that direct repair of the ACL didn't seem to work. Uh, so then came in the era of the extra, initially extra-articular repairs. We'd, we'd do, uh, the, the Jimmy Andrews had a, a, an extra-articular repair. He said that was the way to go, you know, so forth. I'm sure he rused those words. Uh, and finally, uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, Einar Erickson gave a talk at the ACSM. I think it was 79 where he said, we really should be anatomically reconstructing the ACL. We should try to get stuff in there, whatever we were using, whatever reconstructive material we were using, that pretty much anatomically re tried to restore it. And of course, uh, Fetty Fu has carried this to the nth degree and now talks about the double bundles and was very keen on, has been, remained very keen on this, although, as you'll see, interest in this age group, probably the double bundle is not the way to go. But the, pediatric, the, the thought was the pediatric ACL was an unusual problem. This was the textbook of pediatric orthopedics, 1971. This is the Bible. George Lord Roberts was an Englishman. He worked at, in London, and he wrote the first, this is the first book on pediatric orthopedics. I had a, the opportunity to, to rotate with him for a month uh, in his center years ago, when I was in the Air Force, actually. But he said that instability of the knee is very unusual symptom in children. Torn menisci and anterior cruciate avulsions are seen very rarely in kids. So, you know, it doesn't happen in kids, so why bother about it? In youth, the anterior cruciate is strong. Instead of rupturing the anterior insertion, the bone is avulsed. This is the, from Turks, uh, again, the, sort of the Bible of orthopedics at that time, 1976, you see. And uh, he was talking about, he didn't think that intersubstance tears of the ACL occurred in children. 
And I remember hearing lectures on that, where you know, kids, if they do injure the ACL complex, they pull the bone off from the tibia. So that's interesting because we see about 150 uh, ACL injuries a year now at our hospital uh, in, in children. Okay, so clearly that concept is wrong, and, and then we have to figure out what to do about it. But to put it in perspective, a child with an injured knee uh, can have a ligament injury, internal derangement such as osteochondral injury or meniscus injury, problems with the extensor mechanism, quite common in this age group, uh, dislocating patella, subluxing patella, et cetera. Uh, Physeal injuries, hytheal fractures, and then other things like a monoticular JRA, Lyme disease in this area. Unbelievable how much we're seeing. So here's our little friend with a, a brace on his knee, and more about him in, in a few moments. And again, ligament injuries in kids, yep, collateral ligaments, we see them all the time. Any who, anybody who's worked at a ski area sees these little devils coming in, and they've got like a grade one or a grade one half MCL injury, the tender of the MCL, and they all do well type thing. The cruciate ligament, however, started to come into more play with us as kids got involved more and more in organized sports participation. We started to see it in the, um, in the young gymnasts, for instance. We would see it in kids skiing. So it was a rather kind of little 11-year-old with a torn ACL. You know, and then, of course, what to do about it. But the, incident, the recent observation would say that the incidence of the intersubstance tear seems to be increasing, probably because of increased participation, maybe because of increased recognition, uh, they do not do they well untreated. I'll talk about that in some detail. Uh, adolescence is not the problem. We can do a pretty much of an adult-like repair in the uh, uh, reconstruction in the adolescent, and they, they generally do okay. Uh, but prepubescence is the, is the problem. And the interesting thing is, this is a very busy slide, but I'll summarize it. Prepubescent, the incidence of girls and boys is about the same. Whereas we all know that post-pubescent, uh, girls soccer versus boys soccer, ACL injuries, ratio five to one, et cetera, et cetera. So whatever is happening and changing the risk factors for ACL injury in, in, this, in this age group and in this, in this gender situation seems to occur at adolescence, the changes occur. And we, we've got several studies now, we're looking at that, uh, comparing, say, the, 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 the quad hamstring ratio of, of young gymnasts versus young figure skaters, females, and, and so forth. So it's a fascinating concept as to why this gender differential seems to occur at pubescence. Okay? So going through it systematically, diagnosing the ACL, treating it, and then rehabilitation. Diagnosis, you have to have an index of suspicion. Blood in the knee, if you've got a kid that has hemarthrosis, and you could not tell this to some extent better with a, an MRI. This is a study that uh, came from Pittsburgh, Freddie Fu, Carl Stanitsky. Uh, and they found that if a kid had a, a child had a hemarthrosis, um, it could, be, uh, could well be an ACL injury, ACL plus meniscus. And because the medial meniscus in particular is well vascularized in a child, they can get bleeding from a torn medial meniscus. Again, these are relatively uncommon possibilities. But the Lachman test is, is the key test that uh, we've been taught. To, Dr. Joe Torg published the pre test that his teacher had taught him how to do, Dr. Lachman, and basically it's been invaluable and having an index of suspicion, comparing the two knees, of course, because if you're just looking at ballet dancers, they all have Lachman tests until you compare the other side, and they have a Lachman test there, too. But of course, the really thing that's changed, the thing that came in in the late 70s, early 80s, and has progressed exponentially is the, our ability to get MRIs and to interpret them satisfactorily in this age group, and that has been very helpful, along with the, the, the physical examination and, the, of course, the history. What to do about the kid uh, with a torn ACL? That's where the controversy is. And it's a, it's a very, it goes on to the present moment, actually, among us and our colleagues. And we're having a, um, the IOC is having a, a summit on this next uh, spring where we're going to get down and try to thrash this out. Well, the, the question is in every, initial management, operative versus non operative. Uh, operative management, if you decide that you have to, you know, the thing's not working well, or maybe he's got a torn meniscus also, which probably has to be fixed. What surgery to do, the graft choice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the complication is a growth disturbance of the growth plate because these kids have growth plates. That's what makes them a kid. You see this drill hole going right through that tibial growth plate there and so forth. And if I could make an overgeneralization, I would say that those of us who've come from a pediatric uh, orthopedic background are very nervous about the growth plate. Whereas those who come from sort of an adult sports medicine background are not as nervous. So we sort of tippy-toe around the growth plate, you know, how can we avoid getting there and so forth? And I would say that uh, some of my adult colleagues say, 
I'll drill the bugger and he'll probably be okay. What the hell, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so treatment factors, biologic age. You gotta have this if you're gonna speak meaningfully or publish meaningful articles about treating the young ones. You gotta have an idea what their maturation level is. And in particular, get a left risk for bone age. Because in this age group, and the kids we're talking about, the athletically active kids, uh, these, these girls, for instance, uh, uh, ballet students, gymnasts, et cetera, as you, as you all know, they can have chronological age of 14 and a, bo a bone age of 12, okay? Because there's delayed onset of maturation and progression of maturation with training, with heavy training in particular. So please get the bone age before you talk about what you're going to do with the kid and uh, go from there. Injury type. Indeed, there are uh, bony avulsions that are in effect an ACL injury. I'll talk about that again in some detail. Interstitial tears, which we really see a fair amount of, and of course both, where you have a combination. So to talk meaningfully about the management of these injuries, we'll talk first of all about the prepubescence, and then talk a bit about the adolescence. But this is the little kid who tears their ACL, operative versus non-operative, brace and exercise until grown. And when we first started encountering the kids, and I must admit in our clinic, we went this route. We said, well, you know, he's got a torn ACL, nothing else seems to be wrong in the knee. And we'll brace them, and then when they're, they're you know, 14, uh, or girls maybe 13, uh, we'll do a, a, an adult-type surgery where we drill holes through the, through the tibia and through the femur and so forth and so on. That didn't work very well, okay? Uh, I remember one pediatrician's daughter who on her, on her I think her 12th birthday, got a bucket handle tear of a medial meniscus because she had a loose knee. And if you look at the literature, uh, non-operative management has really not been, been very successful. And ranging from early studies, uh, five of seven failures, seven of eight failures, uh, 16 of 22 failures, and so forth and so on. So that became very frustrating. In addition, and for some reason, there may, may be related to the increased vulnerability of the child, once a kid has a torn ACL, they really have an increased chance of tearing up the rest of the knee, which is the thing we all want to prevent. We don't want to have a a, a, a 10-year-old with a bucket handle tear of the medial meniscus, which someone then has not taken out the bucket handle portion of, and that knee is basically doomed, okay, uh, so forth. So this is from Russ Warren's group from, uh, from New York, uh, 39 patients uh, looked at it, 26 associate injuries, delaying more than six weeks with the ACL treatment, increased the meniscus uh, injury. Another study from Texas, uh, pediatric ACL treated greater than 150 days after injury, uh, they had a significant increase in, in medial meniscus tears in particular. So that, that approach probably is not, is not going to be very effective. And we certainly, we must, I must admit, we did that initially. We would put the kids on physical therapy, give them a brace, and say, you know, take it easy with it, and it'll probably be okay. And it, it didn't work out that way. And then again, if you do decide you've got to do a surgery on this kid because he's, they're tearing up their knee, which operation? And the operations are all over the, all over the chart. Extra articular repairs for this age group. Uh, Fysial sparing, and, and you see my, lane, my name is down that list there, 1999. I'll talk to you in some detail about that. And then partial uh, drilling, where some people would drill through the tibia, but not drill through the femur. And we'll show you why that is, and so forth. But here's, a, here's a, where I was forced into this whole scenario. I had a three-year-old kid with a congenitally absent ACL, an unstable knee, and that's the kid you saw earlier. Uh, bracing was unsuccessful, and he kept giving out. Um, and so we came up with, I devised this procedure that where it went around the outside of the knee and through the inside of the knee and stayed totally away from the growth plates, to make a long story short. And it, it's a modification of a procedure that was described by David McIntosh from Canada. And this is basically what it is. This was one of our early articles on this in 1994. And we used the iliotibial band. Therefore, we were not messing with the quadriceps as a, as a donor site. We were not messing with the hamstrings as a donor site. But we were simply going around with the iliotibial band, and, and it was sort of an experiment, if you will, uh, and the interesting things that seemed to work. Since the time, there have been a number of other people talking about this problem, because as like I said, it's becoming a growing topic. This is Alan Anderson. He tries to keep his drill holes in the epiphysis of the tibia and in the epiphysis of the femur and reconstruct that way, again, staying away from the growth plate. And... Um, this is a, a variant that I told you about earlier where they drill the tibia because, as you'll see shortly, the tibia is often not the problem. It's more the concern about the, about the femoral uh, growth plate. Uh, and this is a, a, a procedure, for instance, from Italy where they simply staple the graft up and so forth. So a lot of people are trying a lot of different things. And this is a procedure from Canada, again, drilling tibia 
and then drilling the femur with small holes and small grafts. Okay? And I'll just interject now. If that kid at the age of uh, 11 has, a, say, a 5-millimeter ACL graft put in, uh, how about that graft when he's uh, 18 years old and weighs 240 pounds as an interior lineman? Do you really think it's going to last or hold up? I don't think so. So that's the problem, really. So we're looking at the decision parameters for which operation. Safety, the growth plate issue. And just remember one thing. Operative complications are dramatically underreported in the medical literature. I don't know why that is. I mean, <laughs> when I get a complication, the first thing I think about is publishing it. I, I, I start having someone writing it up, you know, and we're looking at it, and we pop it in the literature. Ha ha. Okay. So there are animal studies that look at the growth plate, and they range over the, all over the place, different animal species, dogs, rabbits, and so forth and so on, suggesting that there are factors such as the size of the growth plate, the size of the drill hole, and which growth plate, and so forth. And then uh, using sheep, basically, uh, Achilles tendon graft, the inner graft, the one thing we learned from the, a lot of these animal studies is that you don't want bone blocks going across the, the, the growth plate, okay? So you don't want to use bone patellar tendon bone, if, if nothing else we've learned from the animal studies. And again, sheep central drill holes, small soft tissue graft, no, no bone graft, and they had no facial fac rest, again, with small drill holes. This is uh, from, uh, again, from New York, and uh, Scott Rodeo uh, was a senior author here. And, and basically what he says is, uh, ACL reconstruction of skeletally immature individuals is complicated by the presence of physis. <laughs> That's the way it is. Animal models can provide insight and direction, but really we, ha we have to provide them with caution to this, the human situation. And then in addition to the animal studies, there have been computer analog studies looking at this sort of central problem the Mars study, a Mars package, uh, and observing that progressive increase in percentage of the, of the femur. This was looking at a volumetric assessment of children's femurs and the size of the growth plate uh, versus the size of the drill hole. And again, uh, Kevin Shea's group, and, then, and the, the, their conclusion was that if you do a double, double bundle, for instance, in a, in a kid, you're going to have it take up a fair amount of the growth plate. So they, they raised concerns about that. The problem really is not so much the tibial growth plate. In fact, it's fairly, fairly resistant. You'll see there are a few injuries reported in literature, but it's the femoral growth plate. And the femur, femoral growth plate, this can happen. You get an angular deformity, uh, loss of alignment. I saw a kid as a second opinion uh, from uh, one of our neighboring states uh, some years ago, and whether or not they, they could, and he was about bone age 14, and whether they could safely you know, do, a, do an ACL reconstruction. They put an 11 millimeter graft in. I mean, they, they, I got the operative, and I, people, the family came back to me about a year and a half later, and he had an angular deformity. And they put too, too big a graft in, 11 millimeter, and they used about bone blocks. And so this can happen even when you think you're in a safe area. Just look at this uh, study as an example. Uh, growth plate fracture of the distal femur, reduced anatomically, fixed with pins. 21% incidence of physial injury. So you look cross-eyed cross at the growth plate of the distal femur, and it can result in, in, in physial injury and growth arrests. And again, uh, there, there have been attempts to look at this in, in other ways. This is a, 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 a computer analog, again, where they talk about the safe zone for putting in a, 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 a graft that lies totally in the in the femoral physis, the growth plate area, the epiphysis of the uh, growth plate. The problem with this is that there's been a recent report within the last year of growth stimulation when you simply do this type of a, of a, of, of a construct through the thing. So you can get increased growth on that side of the, of the physis and, again, po get possibly a, a, a growth arrest. My colleague at Children's, Dr. Dr. Coker, uh, when he was a fellow out in, at the Stedman Clinic, did a, an anonymous survey of the Herodica Society, which is an academic orthopedic sports medicine society, and the ortho, ACL study group, anonymous. Okay. And up till now, there have been three reported cases, up to this time, too, oh, there have been three reported cases of growth plate problems. As you see, uh, eight, two, two, and three, okay, and so on. So it does happen, and it happens, doesn't happen with great frequency, but happens enough where there's cause for concern. Uh, we did a study looking at our adolescent a drill hole where the kid is a bone age 14, say. We then do drill holes through the tibia and through the femur. And five of the 43 had so, some evidence of physial problems. So it's not innocuous. 
The other additional decision parameter, the efficacy, does it really stabilize the knee? And that, of course, is subject to a, a lot of uh, interventional studies, and we need long-term studies, and we'll talk about that in a moment. The biomechanics of these constructs were studied by the group at UCSF a couple of years ago. They published another article since that time. And they evaluate three different types of, uh, of, of, uh, of reconstruction in the... Uh, presumably emulating what's done in the child. The transepiphyseal, the transtibial, and then over the top for the femur to avoid the femoral growth plate, and then uh, iliotibial band, extra enter, in other words, a procedure that we described. And here are the three uh, concepts, three, three procedures that are done for the children. And basically their conclusion was that, uh, that uh, the drill, size of the physis, the size of the drill hole, location of the drill hole, uh, was instrumental. And the construct that most closely emulated the, um, I think I missed this, that's fine. Yeah, basically the, the construct that most closely emulated their, um, there we go, <laughs> hit the wrong button, was the iliotib bent over the top. So again, returning to the scene of the crime. Just to talk about, about how this, this procedure evolved, which obviously we favor and we continue to do, and we're doing more and more of them. And we, we have our third long-term study coming out, out uh, presumably this year or sometime. Uh, but McIntosh had done, was, uh, he'd done an iliotibial band where he looped around the lateral collateral ligament and back to itself, like, like, a, like a lasso on the outside of the knee. As I said, I brought it through on, the, on three cases of congenitally absent ACLs. I was not using it on acquired I injuries at that time. Uh, and then I was sort of forced to do it on a couple of kids who had torn menisci. And here's the procedure once again that we were doing. Here's one of our early patients. I saw her back recently. She's now in her 30s. And it um, seemed to work pretty well for these people. And here's an MRI of a, one of the, re of the constructs, as you see, reconstructions. And the MRI looks like it's a, the ACL uh, graph there is in a pretty good position. And here's a, here's a photo of the uh, intraarticular ACL with revascularization, uh, again, using the iliotibial band. So we've been pretty happy with this. Our first report on this, we looked at nine patients, 10 patients, and I got nine in follow-up. Uh, the the follow-up was, uh, was, uh, uh, was an average of about seven or eight years. And we were encouraged by this initial follow-up, initial assessment, basically. And uh, as I said, initially, we were using it very cautiously, initially in just congenitally absent ACLs. Then we started doing it with ACLs with torn menisci. And now we do it in kids who are going to remain physically active and uh, uh, basically have a torn ACL because we're concerned about the prognosis there. And this is a, our most recent follow-up. Um, we Well, the recently published follow-up. There's one coming out, as I said, after this, which basically uh, showed good results. 42 of the 44 uh, were fine. One of the 44 had an unstable knee, had a, had a revision. ACL. Actually, two patients had revision ACLs at four and a half and eight and a half years after uh, re repair. And of course, the long term outcome in pediatric orthopedics and in general, and in this situation in particular, it's really pretty hard to get long term follow up because it has to be long. You do a club foot repair on, a, say, a two year old. What's the outcome of that? Is a five year, a five -year follow up when they're seven uh, meaningful? But really, the, the, um, the important follow-up is when they're 27 or 37. And those studies are pretty hard to do. You have to live a long time in order to do long-term studies like that. So that's one, of the, that's one of the key problems of pediatric interventions, pediatric surgeries, for instance. And I speak with, with, with all candor about the, the club foot issue because I was of a, the school that did early club foot repairs. And some of them turned out great, some of them not so great. And I just saw a young woman who's now a pediatrician coming back. I did her probably about 20, 25 years ago, her club foot, and now she's having some problems. So we have to be careful about how we generalize from pediatric interventions. Um, and here's an example of what we're talking about. This, is a, this was published in the literature. It's a two-year follow-up of ACL reconstruction in kids where they're drilling through the growth plates and so forth. Two years is almost meaningless as far as a follow-up aspect. Um, George Paletta has never published his articles, but he does, he's a drill hole guy. He drills through the tibia and through the femur and reported at a, a medical meeting on, on this technique. 
And of course, the concern is that this is from George's, uh, from one of George's talks. You've got a vertical um, drill hole in the, in the tibia. That's because that decreases, that takes up less area of the, of the tibial physis, and a relatively vertical one in the, uh, in the femur. And we know from our, our work with adult ACL reconstructions that that's not going to work in an adult. It's too vert. It's not anatomic, basically. So that's the concern. So this is our algorithm, basically. And the top one, I say, we, we, deal, deal, we deal with it now with great caution to, uh, to not do operative intervention here. I think it's taking some risk. You've got to follow these kids carefully. And too many of them develop uh, uh, interarticular changes, meniscus and so forth, articular, which are of concern. So basically, as I said, we were, I was sort of forced into doing this type of procedure on, on kids with meniscal injuries. And then, of course, at the same time, stabilizing the knee. Because if you do a meniscus repair and don't have a stable knee, it's not going to work, and so forth. So again, this is, a, again, a controversy in progress. Some additional thoughts. Partial ACLs. It's really very rare. It probably doesn't, probably doesn't really exist in adults. We used to talk about it. There are articles about it, partial ACLs and, and you know, college football players, that kind of thing. But in kids, I think the incident, the, it really does occur. And you get the kid who's got a Lachman test, but no, no pivot shift, and the knee is swollen up, and you get the MRI, and the MRI looks funny. And again, this is from the Pittsburgh study, showing that they thought they had a fair number of partial ACLs in these kids, too. And that's been our observation. Okay, so based on this, there was a group of kids that I had thought had partial ACLs that I scoped every one of them, I think 30, 40, something like that, kids, and determined what part of the ACL was torn. And the, 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 make a long story short, the post, if the posterolateral bundle was torn, that kid went on and usually loosened up. And Min, Min was, uh, wrote this up. I'm, I'm the NL in a lot of his papers, okay? But I, did, I, I was the one that scoped all these kids. And basically, we found that uh, about, six, about 70% of them did not need surgery. Their knee does remain, remains a little loose. And you know, at five years after, after this non-operative intervention, they still have a bit of a looser knee, but it seems to do fine. So the partial ACL, watch for it in the kids because it probably does not need surgery in 70% of the cases. What we do with these is we follow them. We follow them with physical examination. If they start getting looser and looser and looser, then we go ahead and, and do something. But 70% of them will not. Okay? So if you repair all the, all the, all the MRI-torn uh, ACLs in kids, you're going to be over-operating in, in about a fair number of percentage of them. Tibial spine fractures in children? This is the classic assessment, the Myers and McKeever classification, type 1, minimal displacement, type 2, hinge, completely displaced. My recommendation would be forget about this classification. There's only one thing that counts. When a kid's got a tibial spine fracture, you see it by x-ray, does the knee have a Lachman? In other words, is it stable or unstable? If it's stable, you can certainly treat it non-operatively. But if it's unstable, you, I think you've really got to put that piece back in place. Okay, And... Um, Stable, once again, cast them at about 30 degrees. When I was training in pediatric orthopedics with a, with a tibial spine fracture, we were taught to put the knee in full extension, put a cylinder cast on, the concept being that the condyles would push that piece down into place and that it would reduce and we'd be fine. That's not true. If you put a scope on a kid knee with a, with a, t- a tibial spine fracture and you move the knee back and forth, at about 30 degrees, that's the least tension on that construct. And you can often just, if it's early, you can push that piece back in with a, with a probe. You know, you put it back. You put it in full extension, it lifts back out of the bed. So we were wrong. We were wrong. And I traced back where that came from. It was a study done on cows. They cut pieces of tib- cow's tibial spines out, and then they straightened them out, and they showed that the condyle pushed the piece back into place. So if you ever encounter an ACL tear in a cow, you know what to do. The tibial spine. <laughs> Anyway, so yeah, we think you should reduce them if they're unstable. If they're not unstable, you can treat them non-operatively. Uh, but if they're, unsta- uh, they're uh, unstable, you've got to go in and, and fix them. This is one of our articles. We looked at our, our, our repairs, and they, they do pretty well. We used to fix them like this with pins. that have to come out, obviously, about eight weeks. Then we went to cannulated screws. You see, with reducing the piece. And now more recently, I'm usually using, uh, I'm often using smart nails. Go in, clean out the bed, put it back in place. Smart nails or sutures, put it back where you're going. What about prevention? Well, that's a whole different talk in itself, but I just should say that, that we're on the trail for this, and we, uh, we have a, a big 
some big prospective studies out of our Center for Prevention at Waltham. Uh, and the common denominator seems to be strength training and make the tissue stronger. The, this pig on the left was doing strength training and the pig on the right wasn't. You see the difference in their bony con construct. Uh, so yeah, good old-fashioned strength training for kids. We now know that you can certainly do it, and it's safe if you do it properly. Neuromuscular training, teaching mo movement patterns, a combina com combination of biomechanics of the joint, strength and balance and flexibility, plyometric techniques. And if you look at all the studies that have been done, and, and uh, my colleague, Dr. Sugimoto, just recently wrote an article on this and looking at all the studies that have done, there is evidence that you can, with these interventions, um, prevent the, uh, the occurrence of uh, ACL injuries. What about bracing? I just mentioned at the very bottom. It used to be the dogma that bracing did not prevent ACL injuries. There have been two recent papers out, however, one in, on, on downhill skiing by Dr. Stedman's group and one on motocross showing that it actually does. Okay. The fo early football studies did not show pro prophylactic with bracing, but in these very high-impact activities, there probably is a role for prophylactic bracing. Now I'm going to shift gears totally and talk about repairing the ACL, not replacing it, not, not reconstruction. And this is some very exciting work that Dr. Martha Murray, mm -hmm. uh, my colleague at Children's, has been doing. She's been doing it since she was a fellow with us, since she was a resident, actually, had her own lab. And it's called the Bridge uh, the bridge repair. A um, lot of ACL injuries, as we all know, 550,000 a year. Uh, ACL, ACL reconstruction is currently the gold standard of treatment. We all agree with that. And uh, of course, in adolescence in particular, it's becoming a growing issue. And of course, the young ones, I've already shown you about that. But the child or adolescent, the problem with the reconstruction in the adolescent, we're beginning to realize, is there was one long term study that at 10 years, the graft failure was 50%. That's not very good, okay? And so when we get a girl soccer player, and she comes, we reconstruct her ACL. Nowadays, at six months after the repair, she goes out to the McKaylee Center and has all of her strength and balance and jumping abilities tested. We want to have a ratio of ham to quad of at least 0.6 in these kids, okay? Remember, we're taking the hamstring graft in many cases, okay? So we have to focus, 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 and we usually can get them up there uh, by, uh, by, we at least 50% of them to sports in six months, and after re, re, refocus, re, re exercise, retest in eight months, 93% can go back to sports. But at any rate, the reconstruction is not, is not really as good as we, we once thought. Okay? And again, there are all kinds of reconstruction intraarticular, extraarticular, combined, like I showed you. And then, of course, the concept of repair in, reconstruction, extraarticular, combined, like I told, showed you earlier. But what about repair? Now, this was the landmark article that sort of turned everybody off. When I was a resident, there were, there were a number uh, of different techniques for repairing the ACL. John Marshall from, from New York had all kinds of sutures going in and trying to sew it back where it came from and so forth. They didn't work very well. And for instance, John Fagan at the West Point published a two-year follow-up, the famous two-year follow-up. 83% of his of ACL repairs were successful at two years. Being in the military, okay, he followed the same group of kids up at five years. 94% had unstable knees. That's not very good. Okay? So because of that in particular, that was a landmark, massive article. People went, started hunting down different ways of reconstructing the ACL. And of course, what Martha has asked is, can we avoid reconstruction? Can we come up with a new biologic way to, to enhance the repair of the, of the ACL? Using a protein scaffold, uh, scaffold, she then soaks it in the patient's own blood and puts it in the gap. Uh, and uh, this is biomechanical study she's done on pigs. That's been her research animal. And you see that on the right, the, the, the pig reconstruction and the, uh, and the native ACL had similar stab stability uh, patterns. However, uh, with ACL transection, there's an ACL reconstruction versus bridge enhanced repair. I, I hope you can see that. There's, 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 much, there's, all, there's essentially no degenerative changes on the anticular, on the condyles of the, of the bridge repair that she did on that pig. And um, so I think that was extremely important. That was very important information. Now, I come from Peru, Illinois, and some of my high school friends are now members of the Illinois Valley Hog Growers Association. And they were very excited about this kind of information. Because now they know that 
when they have their pig athletes, they can, uh, there's hope for them. They can have their ACR uh, repaired, and they can continue to be athletes. <laughs> so for Martha finally got a, the, the ability to do a human study, okay, and the FDA allowed us to do 20 patients, 10 having hamstring uh, reconstruction, 10 having the bridge, okay? And to avoid conflict of interest, I was the surgeon on, on, those, 20, on those 20 cases we just, just, just recently completed. I was amazed. These families was, were signing up for something that's totally unknown, a new experimental procedure, and we were able to do our 10, uh, our 10 uh, research subjects in nine months. I'm really, I was amazed that they would sign up for it, quite frankly. And here's Martha with the magical sponge that she puts in that gap. And I don't know what's in it. <laughs> she knows what's in it. It's proprietary, obviously. And surgically, basically, you do have to make an own decision. We go in, we put, a, uh, we put sutures in this. You have to have a, in order to do this, you've got to have a stump of at least eight millimeters on the tibia. Then we put sutures into it, of whip sutures in both directions. So we're, and then we're putting the sponge, we're putting the sutures through the sponge, which she soaks in blood. Here's, here's the blood soak one going in now. And then we have sutures going in both directions, so we have a temporary stabilization of the knee uh, while this is, is healing. And uh, the enrollment's been completed. Uh, as I said, uh, we've got, they're now approaching, all the present subjects are now at least six months now. Uh, and it was, it's been very encouraging, quite frankly, with the testing. No nerve blocks, and so where they had a special protocol for them. Uh, pain, the bear versus the ACR reconstruction, the 10 bears versus 10 ACR reconstructions, uh, the Coos pain score, joint diffusion, very similar. And that's a, a, big, a big deal because when you put biologic uh, implants uh, into, the, into the knee, in other areas like the shoulder, for instance, where there's a, there's a, there's a, 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 a bovine uh, uh, implants put in there, there's a relatively high rate of, of rejection and in, in, uh, chemical interaction and so forth. And this highly purified sponge that she's created seems not to have that problem. From a, so this first, uh, this first test, the bear test one, was, uh, was for safety, not for efficacy. We also measured efficacy. And then looking at the, uh, at the IKDC uh, scores and the uh, sports and recreation scores, KT-1000 at six months is no difference between the reconstruction and the repair. And um, obviously, because we're not using the hamstrings for graft, there's a significantly greater recovery of hamstring strength with Bear at three and six months. And this is our, our first kid. Um, normal ACL on your left. You see right that we're going straight up obliquely. Uh, there's a torn ACL. There's nothing attaching. It's empty, empty notch sign. It's sort of drooping there, but there is a... There is a um, a stub to it. You see, the stub is probably about long enough. We, 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 try to, we try to guesstimate that from the MRI, but we tell the families that if once we get in there, the, the, the base of stub is not long enough, then we have to do reconstruction. We can't do a repair. Okay. And here is that same kid 12 months out, initial uh, MRI, three month MRI, six months MRI. 12 months MRI, and his knee is solid as a rock. Okay, so this is pretty exciting. This is pretty exciting stuff. We can't do prepubescence yet because the FDA won't allow it, obviously, right? They have, we had to have skeletally mature individuals in this first trial. Uh, single center study. The next step is the BEAR2, which we, are, we have just started. We've now done, we have to do 100 patients, and it's doubly blinded. The patient doesn't know which surgery they had, whether they had the reconstruction or the repair. And... Uh, you know the, the song, 99 Bottles of Beer on the Wall? <laughs> That's what we've been using. And we're at 94 now. So in the, in the past three weeks we've been doing this, we've now done six ACLs. Uh, so conclusions, very early, early, early days yet. Needs further study. Who does it work for? How can we improve the technique, basically? And here's the, the, the approval letter in January for the, for the phase two. Investigation limit to U, one U.S. institution and 100 U.S. subjects. Now... This first, the first, the bear, the bear one, uh, Martha asked me to do the surgery. And, you know, I'm not a communist or a hippie, so I insisted on being poor, uh, paid for the surgery because I did the surgery. So we agreed on the price of $1 per case. And so <laughs> those, there's my, ten, my $10 payment, okay? So I think that um, I'll just run through maybe this first case, then we'll open it for questions and answers. Um, patient history, 13 years old, twisting injury right knee, three years previously. 
and they went to an orthopedist, and they were told that, well, yeah, he probably had an ACL injury, but you can't do it. You can't repair ACLs in kids, right? So you, know, you have to wait until you for your surgery. So when he, by the time he came to see us, uh, he had uh, an internal derangement. Uh, he had uh, a medial meniscus tear and a lateral meniscus tear. Thigh atrophy, lacked full extension. That's because he had a bucket handle medial meniscus tear stuck in the joint. Medial joint line tenderness. Here's his MRI. Okay, initially. Um, and then it doesn't show up. That's the MCL, the medial meniscus in the joint. Arthroscopy, ACL repair, transficeal, meniscus repair. He was old enough by bone age. Would you do that? Possibly. Actually, his bone age, I think, was 12, wasn't it? Old enough. Or would you do a reconstruction? And we did an ITB reconstruction, repaired the bucket handle, repaired the anterior detachment lateral meniscus. But, and here's his bone age, as you see, the youngest kid, so forth. So always get the, the risk for bone age, and, and then you know what you're dealing with. So I think I'll wrap it up there and maybe answer it up to some questions and comments from the audience. I, I, I certainly would like to hear comments, too, and everything else. Thanks a lot. Ever, do you ever envision the bear procedures being done on adults? On adults? Yeah. Yeah, that's what we're doing now. The, the age here is, is, uh, six, is 14 to 35. 14 to 35. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. But we, hope, we think it'll be, if it works in that, in that age group, we think it's really going to work in the little ones. Yeah. Uh, the beauty of the kids is, of course, they heal pretty quickly, and we rarely get arthrofibrosis. Arthrofibrosis is when you have too much healing, and the whole middle of the notch gets filled up with scar tissue and so forth. And the risk factors for it, based on a study we did, are uh, meniscus repair, where you limit the motion initially, um, and uh, if you use a the, the using a bone patella tendon bone graft was a high, was a risk factor also for getting arthrofibrosis. We've, we essentially don't get it in the, in the young ones. I've had one case ever, and the kid's father had arthrofibrosis when he had his ACL fixed. So, um, but by and large, that's the beauty of working with the kids. They, you, you can immobilize them a bit longer, you might the adult, you know, if you have, say, a tibial spine, and they still get their motion back. As far as prevention, Dai Sugimoto is sitting right behind you, and he's... He is in charge of our, our prevention uh, interventions, and, and I think that um, time will tell. I, I think putting all the various things that have been done together, Di's pa recent paper last year on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the common positive factors for prevention programs are basically everyone has to buy into it. The kids have to do it. <laughs> and the coaches have to believe in it. The parents have to believe in it. The kid has to believe in it. And it has to be done right through the year. And it has to have components of neuromuscular training. It can't just be strength training. It can't just be jumping training. But a combination of all of them seems to work the best. And all over the, all the world, from, Nor from Norway, uh, Southern California, Burt Mandelbaum study group, and so forth. So you mentioned a high failure rate on a lot of these kids that are getting ACL reconstruction before the physis closes. So is this more of a temporizing measure, preventing some sort of damage so that when they're adults they get another ACL reconstruction? Yeah. The prepubescent ones have not had a high failure rate. The reconstructions with the hamstrings, which we used to do, we do you know, a lot of, they have a higher failure rate than we would have anticipated initially. And I think that's just getting out to even all the surgeons now. So you better tell the families that, you know, she has a... she has a risk of tearing this graft, and she has an increased risk of tearing the other ACL. So there's something about the factors she has we haven't determined yet. Maybe it's the notch width, uh, notch width uh, maybe it's peripelvic strength, and so forth and so on. But, you know, we're trying to prevent these kids from joining my younger daughter's club. ACL, a year later, ACL. Mm -hmm. Tore both her ACLs at almost exactly a year apart. So the extra physeal IT band um, a a procedure that you talked about, are there any long-term ramifications of that? I know you said there's not enough long-term data, but what are your thoughts about that long-term? Well, the, the, the study we're about to publish is, is getting close there. It's about eight years follow-up. 
And I, when I first proposed it to the families, I told them it was an, in, an interim solution. I said we'd probably have to go back at the, when they got older and drill the holes. Didn't turn out to be the case. We kept, I kept following these kids, and they were doing fine. The first kid I did, that three-year-old with a congenitally absent ACL, went to Dartmouth, played lacrosse, not Harvard, Dartmouth. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he's now a helicopter skier. And I've got a 30, oh. 32-year follow-up with him because his, his mother's still a hub volunteer at the hospital. And he's doing fine. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, We want to do these within six weeks of injury. So we sort of expedite them when we see them. Uh, uh, we try to get the motion back as much as we can, but we want to try to do them early. Biologically, we think that's an important factor uh, in, the, uh, in the reconstruction. It's, I think that's a major thing. And uh, we're, ner- we're just nervous about using nerve blocks. There's been a literature on nerve blocks done at the time of ACL repair and suggesting that there may be some long-term weakening effects of the quad when you do a femoral nerve block and so forth. So they're having none of that. They're just doing it, just having the reconstruction. Or I'm sure they repair. Uh, can you give us some insights on when you tell uh, a child they can't go back and play? Maybe they failed a couple of those still reconstructions. Or, you know, that parent is looking to get you in the face saying, this kid has got to go get a scholarship in soccer. Maybe they've had two ACL reconstructions, but the time you see them, uh, you know, obviously that's a... No. Okay, question, but how do you Maybe you never have told the kid not to go um, That is a very, very difficult problem, particularly the girl soccer player, and the family knows that she's going to be the next Mia Hamm. And you know, so she's had a couple ACL tears. What the hell, you know, just, hey, Doc, go in and fix it again. It's sort of, um, I, I, I try to give them the best advice I can, but ultimately, of course, the kid comes in to see us, they've maybe retorn their initial surgery. Now, you know, on the, on the same knee. And we're certainly going to fix it. But as far as return to play, I, I, I basically try to give them the statistics. But I would say that the majority of them will return to play. Yeah, despite all, you know. I've got one kid, uh, uh, two ACLs on one knee, uh, one on the other. I did the, the second and third surgeries. And uh, she's playing uh, college freshman soccer. So I think that's a really tough, that's a, one of the toughest issues is the family's sort of belief that sort of surgery fixes it. Oh, yeah, you had surgery. Yeah, yeah. Ulnar collateral ligament. Okay, Tommy John. Maybe we should do it prophylactically. <laughs> but people have asked that question. People have asked that question. Jimmy Andrews has story after story about that. The family will come to, to him, six, you know, a 15-year-old, uh, and he's a good pitcher. And should we, maybe should we just fix that ligament now, Doc, and... So, you know, he'll be protected from that injury. Okay. I don't know. Reality check. <laughs> Doc, I know you don't have a lot of data, but one of the things that jumped out with the bear was a lack of extension at six months. Any concern for that fund growing big and hammering their extension and hammering their, their function later on? Yeah, I think that basically... Um, since it's a repair, there, there is, I suppose, some theoretical concern for getting a, a, a big wad of repair tissue in that notch, you know, and so forth. I have not gone back uh, to trim one out yet, but that may be a theoretical concern. If you get too much of a good thing, you know, boom, and all forms in there. But the, all the, the ten that we've done so far, of course, they're young, they're, they're young adults, uh, and they have not had a, a problem with function. Yep. Great. Thanks a lot. Thank That concludes this program. This material was recorded and produced by Mobile Tape Company Incorporated of Valencia, California. More information about other available media may be obtained by calling 1-800-369-5718 or on our website, mobiletape.com, 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 mobiletape.com. Mobile tape.